free mind. You crazy for this. Soulful. It's like our responsibility to make us feel something. You know, to make people feel. Make people feel what we feeling. Hey, yo. Reggie here, and I want to welcome you to another one of my live streams. This is Comics Today, a show that we do on Wednesday to celebrate the best day of the week, that being New Comic Book Day. And as part of this show, we talk about some news and current events, and I typically have a guest or two on that will help me to make sense of something that is happening in the world of comics and collectibles and tonight is just like every other night because we are going to have a couple of guests on. And as a reminder, we are going to build upon uh, some we're going to build upon some themes that were spoken about earlier this week. Uh, and as a reminder, this podcast, this will be rebroadcast as part of a podcast uh, while it's available. While the podcast is still available, you can definitely check us out on your preferred podcasting platform. Earlier this week, I spent some time talking about artificial intelligence, and uh, that video has been viewed on Instagram by more than 122,000 people as of uh, my last check. But we're actually going to build upon what was started on Instagram tonight, and we're also going to talk about another topic that very closely ties with this idea of artificial intelligence created artwork. And we're going to get to that and our guests in just a few moments. And I will be going to the chat here because this is a celebration of new comic book day. I like to go to the chat to find out what it is that people may have picked up at their LCSs earlier today. And if they read something that was particularly good that we should all put on the top of our reading stacks, I want to know that as well. Every single week, there are people that will comment that they don't know what to read. They don't know what's good out. They ask questions about, is this book or that book good? That is part of the reason why we do this show on Wednesday to celebrate New Comic Book Day and also give a little bit of guidance to some folks out there that are trying to figure out where they should spend their hard-earned money. And I know a couple of people did not make it to the LCS today, either because they were sick or the weather was bad or work got in the way of all the good fun. But fingers crossed, there are some individuals here that were able to make it to an LCS. So even if the book is not new, if it is a new to you book. I want to hear about that. So I'm going to go to the chat here real quick. <laughs> I just saw a comment from one of the blue wrenches that, that made me chuckle. I am not going to repeat it, but it, it, if you do not come to the live streams, you are definitely missing out on at least half of the show because the stuff that I talk about with guests is, is part of the entertainment. But the live stream itself is the other part of it. So let me scroll past some of those comments. If you made it to your LCS, let me know what you picked up. If you want to shout out your LCS, you can do that as well. Bulldog is the first on the on the uh, list here. Bulldog, Batman, Spawn, Power Man 24, and Black Knight issue number one. Bulldog, it is good to see you, brother. No doubt about it. Kingpin Comics is sitting in the parking lot right now in the dark. He's sitting in the parking lot with his... If there's uh, comics in the chair next to him watching some Reggie on his cell phone, Kingpin says, just got my books now sitting in the parking lot. That's what's up. Uh, well, let me see. I'm scrolling through. What did what'd you pick up? What is this? The newest Iron Man and also Deadpool got that last night. Uh, that's what's up. Good stuff. I'm scrolling through. I'm scrolling through. Herman, how you doing, brother? It's good to see you. He picked up Amazing Spider-Man issue number 15. That's what's up. Scrolling through. The list see what else you guys picked up uh kevin how you doing brother kevin wheeler says i just scored a copy of ultimate fallout 4 i'm sure that it's not grade worthy paid five dollars for it uh kevin i'm going to go out on the limb and say you sir are correct if you pay five dollars does it have a cover is it <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, it, it, even if it is not a grade worthy book, it is still an awesome book to pick up. That's what's up. Mark, how you doing, brother? It is good to see you. Uh, what 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 is this mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom 1965 NBC comic book giveaway? 
He says that that book is new to him. That's what's up. <laughs> Trav, the shipping guru. It's good to see you, brother. Trav picked up the new Batman uh, Spawn book, the the much anticipated book. I think that is that uh, Capullo, Capullo, and uh, and Todd McFarlane. I think teamed up on that. He picked up Iron Man one and also Mondo, Mando, Mando. Scrolling through some of the comments here, seeing what else you guys may have picked up. Iron Man number one, the the Bob Layton variant cover says Turbo Todd. It's good to see you, brother. Uh, scrolling through, seeing what else you guys may pick. <laughs> Seth says his LCS is Swolger Publishing. No, sir, you you will never see a Swolger Publishing LCS. I don't want to work that hard. I'll be completely honest with you. I don't want to work as hard as the shop owners because they put in they put in the work. There is no doubt about it. Beck, how you doing? It is good to see you. Uh, scrolling through. Steve says, picked up 12 books, no variants, not a single variant from his LCS comic book addiction. A few examples include Radiant Black, uh, Three Keys, Dark Rider. Uh, Steve, I'm going to go ahead and say that your 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 LCS needs to uh, very quickly address your, your addiction or lack thereof if you have picked up 12 books with no variants. I don't know how addictive uh, that shop really is. If you are coming out of there scot-free with no variants in your hands. Uh, scrolling through, Doug says, what is that? He got Reggie on the back screen having issues. It's not my fault, sir. It's not. It is not my fault if the big screen is not working for you. Victor, it's good to see you. Batman 131, Flash 789. I think those are new to you books. Uh, picked up ASM 316 for $155, says Rob Boswell. Rob, it's been, it's good to see you. It's been a while since I've seen you, my friend. Uh, it's good to see you. Congrats on being able to pick up that book. I remember when ASM 316 was not going anywhere nearly that cheap at every grade. That book was ridiculously expensive. Comics by the Bay, it is good to see you. Uh, scrolling through some of the names here. There you go. <laughs> KFXG is like... ASM 360, 316 for 155. Yeah, man, that welcome to the post pandemic era where things are like not in a great place. Well, in a good place if you're buying, because definitely it's a, in a good place for people that have been priced out of books. Uh, things are getting back down to earth, which I think is a wonderful thing. Fantastic. How you doing, brother? It is good to see you, Patrick. How you doing, Chuck? It is good to see you. He says, received a nice eBay run this weekend, plus some pre-magazine mad comics. That's what's up, Chuck. It is always good to see you, my friend. Uh, scrolling through some of the comments, uh, Sidian, how you doing, brother? It is good to see you. Uh, scrolling through. Uh, Danny, how you doing? Uh, Danny says he picked up various Spawn Batman variants, ASM 15, Planted, Hulk, World's Breaker, and a few additional comics. That's what's up. Jason, it's good to see you, my friend. Tina is the OG, and it is, and it is always good to see you, my friend. Dark Messiah, number five, SSFX. Uh, man, I butchered that. SSFD. There we go. I, I totally butchered it. It is good to see you, uh, whatever your name is. Good to see you. All right, so as I mentioned, there's going to be a couple of topics that we are going to get to over the course of the show. We're going to have a couple of guests on that are going to help me to make sense of this. And what I will tell you is, believe it or not, the topics that we are going to get into tonight are actually connected. They are actually connected because they both have to do with with creators. They both have to do with creators, but in different ways. And um, fingers crossed that we can land the plane uh, and be able to connect all the dots that have to be connected. The very first thing that I want to tee up for you guys before I get to my first guest is an article that appeared on Bleeding Cool earlier this week. I think it actually popped up over the weekend and I saw it. I can't remember who sent it to me. It might have been Mark that sent it to me. Uh, along with a couple of other people, because I tend to get the same article from multiple people, which uh, allows me to make sure that I don't miss anything. But this article came in from Ble Ble Bleeding Cool. I'm not a huge fan of Bleeding Cool, but essentially what they did is they they basically pulled down a bunch of posts that were on the Twitter. And so I feel better about it because I was able to go to Twitter to actually read some of these comments myself. But But the gist of this thing is that uh, some comic book creators are not getting paid by publishers. That is the long and short of it. They're not getting paid. Either they are not getting paid on time or they're not getting paid at all. And it doesn't matter whether you are an artist or a writer. It seems to be something that is actually happening. And what's really interesting 
is that one of these creators was brave enough to put up a post on Twitter that was then uh, added to by a lot of other creators. This thing was, was commented on, it was retweeted, it was all of that stuff that you would imagine. And so what might be thought of as an isolated thing appears not to be an isolated thing. And that's part of the reason why we wanted to talk about it. Because anytime someone does good work, they should be compensated for their work. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And so uh, this is the article right here, Comic Book Publishers Not Paying Comic Book Creators. And it says uh, uh, Will Will Robeson, who I honestly was not familiar with, but he is a comic book artist on things like Great Lake Adventures, Avengers. Uh, Big Trouble in Little China, Spider-Man, Deadpool, Spider-Ham, Secret Wars, uh, and a couple of other things. I also think he did Edge of Spider-Verse, which is maybe where some people know him from. Uh, but he, he put up a post and it says, has it become industry standard to pay creators ridiculously late for their work? I've been struggling all year with all the large companies I work with four to get paid on the agreed time. I'm talking months late. It's sad how nervous I am to even talk about this publicly in fear of being blacklisted for future work, but I've heard so many horror stories from other freelance creators recently about fighting for their paychecks and need to vent this all out and hopefully raise some awareness to make some serious change. So this is a guy that is stepping out there. Uh, he's heard about this from other people. Now he's speaking about his own experiences. Now, again, he's saying large companies. He's not saying small companies, but he is saying large companies. And there's only so many. There's only so many large companies. And part of what I started to think of is, is he turning in his work on time? Let's be honest. If you've ever worked with creative people, they can sometimes slip on some deadlines because they're being creative, they're being inspired, all that kind of stuff. They don't they don't necessarily think like me in terms of like specific deadlines. Get it done. They are a, the creative people are a little different, right? So I started to think maybe that's it, right? That that does not seem to be the case because in this very large paragraph, he actually goes through in a lot of detail about how it actually works, how the projects work, how he's supposed to get paid. He highlights, you know, that he is turning his work in on on time and he's getting additional work from these publishers, but they're not doing their part, which is to actually pay him. And he says, I work hard. I hit all my deadlines, pay me. And that does not seem like a whole lot to ask for. I do my work, compensate me for the work that is being done, he says. And to clarify, I'm not talking about editors being the issue, which I think is good because he is placing the blame kind of sort of where he thinks it should belong. And it's not on the editors. He says, my editors are wonderful and fight with me to get paid. But that itself is bonker, is a bonkers thing to say that an employee of a company fights with me to get paid by the same company that they work for. He says, if you're if, if you're like me and have had these or are having these issues with the comic book industry and these large corporations, post your stories below. I know that I'm not the only one struggling to make change. And, and backing up here a moment, he says, uh, but when you're drawing these characters and internally stressing over whether you can afford to buy your family Christmas presents this year due to payment delays, then enough is enough. And, and that's that's kind of hard hitting, to be honest with you. A lot of people are struggling right now with the economy. And Christmas, if you have a family and you want to do right by that family, is not a cheap time. Trust me, I know from experience. And he highlights here, I, I mean, I get to draw these iconic characters owned by these large corporations who are making millions off of adapting freelancers like myself's uh, art and creativity. So again, this is a guy that is, he has some experience, right? I mean, he is not an unknown person that has not worked on some great characters. He has worked on some big characters for some big companies. And as I went through some of the other things, we see a post here from Zach Thomas and another from Joe Q. Zach highlights here that he too has had uh, a lot of late payments. And what's really interesting is that a publisher actually optioned a book that he was working on, you know, option where they got paid and then turned around and told him he could not be paid. Zach Thomas is actually a writer. He has worked on things like Cable, Edge of Spider Geddon, Kazar, and Yandu. And then again, we have uh, Joe Q here who 
he highlights some other stuff. He says, I w- recently waited over a year for one publisher before getting paid and currently still awaiting payment running six running on six months now from a second prominent publisher who has largely ghosted me relating to two separate covers I crafted for them last summer. Uh, And again, this is not an unknown person right here. He has worked on Amazing Spider-Man, Captain Marvel, Action Comics, Dial H for Heroes, and also currently working, I do believe, on Batman 89. He highlights also that he knows other artists that are in the similar boat that aren't getting paid for the work that they've done yet the publishers continue to call them for more work and and it's it's this i can only imagine what it's like where somebody owes you money but you need the work so you can't turn the work down but you need the money and you're not getting what is actually due to you this this is a very long article that kind of captures a lot of comments that were actually made on uh twitter Um, I would encourage you to check it out because some of these folks go into a lot of detail about how publishers owe owe them lots of money. And the other thing I will say here before I go to our guest is that uh, only one publisher is actually named. Valiant was the only publisher that was named by name. The others chose not to reference any publishers. I will also say that uh, some of the creators highlighted that They were not paid in some instances, and it was truly a clerical error. It was a mistake where they were not paid, and in some cases, those oversights have been addressed. But again, in in other ways, they are still not being paid on time, uh, if at all. And so again, uh, you know, I, I read through these posts. I went to Instagram. I'm sorry, into Twitter. I read some posts over there. I actually sent a message to Valiant. I sent a message to Valiant asking if they wanted to comment on it. No response. I sent a message to Will Robeson as well, trying to see if I can get some additional information from him. No response there. But again, I, I, I try to do my due diligence to try to dig into this issue uh, that I believe is a little problematic. Now, with that said, I want to actually go to the first guest of the night that can potentially help me to maybe make sense of some of this stuff. I want to welcome to the show, Afram. Afram, it is good to see you, brother. How are things? What's up, brother? How are you? Thank you so much. I am doing well. I I just spent an hour with my boy at football practice freezing. Uh, (laughs) It's cold and it's raining here. And uh, I scrambled in here to get for to do this interview. So, yeah, I'm up in Buffalo, New York. That's why I got this thing. Brother, warm. I, I apologize for complaining about my weather in North Carolina when you live in Buffalo. I, I'm sorry. Uh, you win. You win. Afram, you, you've you read this article. You've yes. processed through it. What are your thoughts? To be perfectly honest, when I first read it, my initial impulse was I felt really sad because you think that these artists are there at a breaking point because they typically wouldn't have these conversations, let alone publicly. And if the shoe was on the other foot, they'd get blacklisted as was stated in the, in the pro you know, in the article. And then what would happen to them? The, the bigger companies, these unnamed publishers, but if you read and kind of do a little bit of uh, detective work, you can kind of put two and two together and figure out who they're talking about yep. and uh, they'd be in a bad spot. So it, it hurts to think that artists would get to a point where they're even considering leaving the craft, you know? So that's what I felt initially. The question is, man, like, didn't we already go through this? Like, didn't we go through this whole thing of creators not getting the credit and getting compensated like Jack Kirby and Neil Adams? Didn't we go through this already? I think there's a lot of short memories in the, in the comic (laughs) world. And just in general, you know, these things repeat, Um, some of these bigger companies, and I try to think about it the same way you did, like maybe could, could these artists have missed deadlines, but then when they got a little bit more articulate about it, assuming the allegations are hundred percent accurate, then, you know, it's, it really does fall on the, on the publisher and are they waiting, you know, are the artists expendable because there's not really a union or an agent or someone to get their back in these kind of proceedings, you know? That's yep. kind of the thought that I had. I mean, I had a lot of thoughts rolling through my mind, right, as I was going through this. And one thing that I, I want to uh, make mention of, and I may have you do it. Part of the reason why I wanted you to come on is because you are an actor, right? Yes. You are a comic book writer. 
Yes. And you are also doing some editing for Legacy Comics, correct? Yes, I'm the senior editor at Legacy Comics. Right. So so this isn't out of like uh the 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 realm of possibility that that you should be commenting on this because after all, you are a creator. Now, could could you imagine working your tail off to put out the the comic that is on your hat right now, right? <laughs> And then to not be compensated by your publisher. I mean, it's, 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 I struggle to think about that. If you do work, you should be paid. Am I wrong to think that? Not at all. I mean, I'm kind of baffled when you read about that because you think these, this should be um, below these larger publishers. Like it should not be an issue. They should have, they should want to have artists flocking to them to be kind of the next level of their careers. But you have people not being paid for, upwards of a year or more, you know, like I said before, considering leaving the craft altogether. And then what, you know, really, what would we have? It's, I'm a writer, but the artists are the ones who manifest these stories into reality. If it wasn't for them, they'd be short stories and novels and good luck getting someone to read that. <laughs> well, well said, brother. There's yeah. no pictures. I don't know about that. Yeah. One. Where are the pictures? Uh yeah, where where are the pictures, right? I mean, in artists and writers, it, I mean, they all work hard, right? Everybody yes, works yes. hard. Everybody that works should be compensated. There is no doubt about that in my mind. But but let let's talk about it. Do you think? And I'm going to ask you to walk out on a limb just a little bit. Do okay. you think that the non-payment is purposeful? Is it oversight? Is it accidental? Is is the machine actually broken? And is that potentially why these folks are not getting paid? Like, what's your thought there as to the root cause of the problem? The, the impulse just goes towards the, the machine is either broken or there's just a general disregard for freelance artists. Because mm -hmm. I think there's this culture of like, hey, you get you get paid an exposure, man. We'll get you when we get you kind of a thing. And, and that's very much disrespectful to any creator because they are the ones, and we know this from history, they're ushering in cultural change through comics. Things that are in the, the zeitgeist of the news or whatever have been 30, 40 years in comics addressed already. So there has to be a deeper respect there. I think it is broken. I think maybe too many, too many cooks in the kitchen and it's just a mad scramble at some of these places and they could they could miss it as an honest clerical error, but yeah. it's happening too many times for that to be, if it happened once off or something and you'd be like, oh, well, they fixed that. But after one person came out, then everyone else had the confidence to come out behind them and put out these tweets and say, hey, it's happened to me too, multiple times. And it's actually common practice, which yeah. that was the part that really got me. It's like, oh, wow. That, takes a lot of guts to come out and say that about bigger companies without naming them, obviously. No doubt. I mean, yeah. like I remember the whole um, unionization that was trying to form mm -hmm. over at Image Comics, right? And I don't think yeah, that comic I fully- book Workers United? That... Something like that, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, at the time, did not fully appreciate how small Image was in terms of like their staff, the actual people that are employed by them. It's not a large number of people. So part of me was like, okay, well, maybe the accounting department doesn't have the right procedures and policies in place, right? But then when you start to read that this is routine, the non-payment, the delays in payment, yeah. that is a systematic type of thing that is being put in place. And, and I want to thank you for underscoring that you are a writer. It's not often that you hear zeitgeist in a conversation. So uh, <laughs> well, well done, sir, on that, on that writing front. I had a chance to talk with your folks over at Legacy Comics. And one of the things that they kind of pointed out to me is that they kind of form Legacy Comics to do what they felt the industry should be right fair compensation for fair work yes, and, yes. and i don't know that i appreciated that uh, but can you talk a little bit about like what it's like to work with legacy what your relationship has been with them and maybe what your wall's relationship is with your own creators yes. that are working for you to, to uh, put out the books that you guys release i'll be more than happy um i'll say patrick hickey jr who is the um owner and editor-in-chief of legacy comics He's the guy that <clears throat> he's the madman basically runs a very tight ship. So at the very beginning, um, without giving away too much, he, he sets the expectation. The expectation is agreed upon and we go from there. So it's not l said lightly. It's like, Hey, 
this is the deadline. Can you realistically make this right? And your, your word is your bond at the moment. Obviously external circumstances sometimes can happen and things get worked on, but we try from the very beginning to set up a very tight ship in that regard with high respect to the creators involved, because we know, and I know from my other lines of work that, you know, you're going to be eating peanut butter and sleeping on couches for a while before you really get it together and, and start making real strides in the, in any creative industry. Yeah. And, and, you know, as a, as a publisher myself, and I, I use that term very, very lightly when I talk about myself as a publisher, um, when you start to put out content and you start to work with creative people, I think when you start to work with them, you appreciate just how hard they work. When I talk to some of my creators and they talk about how long it takes them to produce a page, but then you look at the page and you're like, well, I kind of get why it took you so long because the thing is gorgeous. I think that they should be compensated for the work that they do. At Absolutely. the end of the day, uh, you work, you should be compensated. People should do what's right. And and I think if we all embrace, I think you said his name was Patrick. If we all embrace Patrick's philosophy, maybe uh, we will all continue to be able to enjoy uh, this hobby and this wonderful content that is created by these writers and by these artists. Um, One other before, thing I'll before, add. Uh, get, jump in mind. there, brother. Um, compensated but also appreciated because mm. i think a lot of these artists have to themselves push on social media and do these other things and i think these bigger companies they have it in them to be able to do hey let's feature this artist this is our cover artist this is somebody who did this like we've at legacy comics have tried to do that where we kind of take a almost like a a, a pro wrestling promo style where we've featured our artists or talked about them talked about where they come from because that's just as important because if you only see the art, but you attach that to the publisher, you're kind of missing an element there. You're, you're not really appreciating like pay is nice. Of course it covers the bills. You can get those holiday presents that you want to get for the family. Um, but I think the appreciation also kind of fosters a, a positivity around that line of work that create that creative work. Just because you're a freelancer doesn't mean that you have to be treated like a redheaded stepchild. That's basically what I just heard you say, right? Yes. Like, yes. have some respect for me. Help me help you kind of thing, you know? Because these big and, publishers, and I, I they want the hit. They want the hit. They want like, hey, get me that next big comic that turns out to be Miles Morales or turns yeah. out to be, you know, fill in X character. But you're not going to put your all into something when someone <clears throat> doesn't appreciate you. That's, you know? a, and that's I, magic. That's like a little bit of magic meeting the respect of the artist. And then something, the creator yeah. creates something that then does hit the comic community and everybody wants all the variants and they want all the 9.8s and they want, you know, Be, being kind and praising someone literally costs you nothing. Absolutely. It literally costs you nothing. But Afram, um, I would try to pronounce your last name, Afrim, but your your lesson that you conveyed to me earlier did not stick. Uh, before I let you go, why don't you go ahead and shout out, uh, you know, where people can find you on social media? Sure. Again, you are a creator. You have a comic out. You're working with Legacy Comics. Go ahead yes. and do the whole shout out where people can find you if they want to tune in to what you put out. Okay, three quick things. One, The Legend of the Night Owl. This is a story that I wrote about my mother that takes place in kind of a version of uh the film the warriors meets streets of rage and she is an albanian muslim crime fighter that's addicted to coffee and has a shadowy past number one is about to have a uh exclusive cover uh done by johnny desjardins and it's a bulletproof comics exclusive so mm. you can find that and support it at legacycomics.com legacy with an x so we're going very 90s style with that comics with an x.com and uh the last name is jambalai like the stew yeah afram thank you brother, <laughs> for coming on <laughs> i appreciate you coming on man and providing a little bit of insight uh good luck to you out there and if there's something you need don't hesitate to reach out same to you thank you brother take care peace so i had a chance to meet i had a chance to uh to meet afram at um New York Comic Con. And uh, we, we had a, a brief conversation. New York Comic Con was kind of crazy, but it was awesome to be able to meet him uh, face to face uh, ever so briefly at New York Comic Con. I have a feeling that I'll probably see him at some place down the road. Let me let me glance over real quick at the chat real quick. Trev is saying good conversation. Uh, 
<laughs> there you go. Patrick is giving us the phonetic spelling uh, of, of his last name. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Uh, I definitely appreciate that. Uh, there you go. Doug is saying great job. There you go. Let me see. I'm scrolling through some of the comments here. Uh, scrolling, scrolling. I think I'm all caught up. Shout out to Patrick at Legacy Comics uh, for allowing my brother to release his first comic. There you go. That's what's up. Um, it is it is a special thing, man. I mean, again, we we have we have put out a couple of issues of a comic, and it is a wonderful thing to be able to see the the process from beginning to end, to be able to see an idea and and words on a page suddenly become a finished comic in your hands. And and I can write a little bit, but not fiction writing, and I certainly cannot draw. And but I can be a part of these things, and it's really cool to be a part of this stuff and to be able to see it come to life. I could not imagine, I could not imagine running a business that benefits upon the work of other people and then not compensating those people for that work. I struggle with that. I struggle with that big time. And I want to give a huge shout out to every single one of uh, the creators that had the courage to speak out on social media about what they are experiencing. Uh, I love this hobby. And, and if you're watching this show, more than likely you love this hobby as well. And it is only through uh, raising the flag, raising awareness and highlighting when things are not right, that things will potentially change. And again, I said it before, I feel like we're going back in time. I feel like this mistreatment of artists is something that we have already gone through. And you would assume that we would have already learned our lessons from it. But like Afram said, the industry may have short memories. Uh, but hopefully we as collectors do not have short memories and we remember the mistreatment of of a lot of really amazing creators. And, and hopefully we will not allow this to continue happening in the future. That is, again, part of the reason why I wanted to talk about it, because I believe that it is a serious issue. All right. So the next thing. The next thing that I wanted to talk about, again, is, is building upon something that I spoke about earlier this week, and it builds upon what we just spoke about a few moments ago. And, and I want to jump into this article. This article was pretty widespread. I found this one. Uh, I don't know which one of the, the comic book soldier reporters that sent it to me, but one of the reporters sent it to me to make me aware of uh, what was happening out there with uh, one one specific artist. There was there was one um, specific artist that actually passed away. And no sooner than he passed away, somebody was, was essentially trying to benefit off of his work. And the community has just, the, the community has exploded to basically, you know, uh, come to the defense of this creator that has passed away that is potentially being taken advantage of. And it actually relates to artificial intelligence. And again, we're going to have a guest on that's going to spend a little bit of time talking with us about some of this stuff. But first, I want to do a little bit of setup by talking about this, this article. So this is the article right here, AI generated art art sparks furious backlash from the Japanese anime community. And so you can see some of the beautiful art that is actually right here. And as you look at this art, you might think that this was created by a human hand. It was not. It was created by artificial intelligence, but it was created on the backs of a Korean artist. On October 3rd, uh, uh, Korean artist Kim jong G, I think that's how you say it. Kim Jung G passed away unexpectedly at the age of 47. Uh, he was beloved for his innovative ink and brushwork style of artwork uh, that that was captivating audiences for a long time. This guy has done a live streams where he is like from memory doing these intricate drawings that are just they're, they're mesmerizing. But it says just days after he passed. A former French game developer known online as 5U fed the artist's work, fed his actual creative work into an AI model. He then shared that model on Twitter as a homage to the artist, allowing any user to create art in the style of this artist simply prompted by text. The artwork showcased dystopian battlefields, food markets that was eerily accurate 
to the artist's own work. So the way that this stuff works, and again, I am not an engineer. I've actually spoken to some engineers earlier this week to help me to understand some of this stuff. But essentially what you have to do when you have an artificial intelligence engine is you have to educate it. You have to educate it by feeding it images and you have to give it a lot of images in order for it to create something, right? So in this case, this, this French uh, developer or programmer fed into his AI engine, the artwork from this, this creator who had just passed away. He pumped the, all of the artwork into the AI and then basically gave people the ability to create artwork using this guy's style. It's not created by this guy, it's created by the AI, but it's built upon the, the back of his work. And a lot of people say that this is theft. A lot of people are saying that this is actually theft. And it says here, uh, the response was pure disdain. And it says, Kim G left us less than a week ago and AI bros are already replicating his style and demanding credit. Vultures and spineless, untalented losers was one of the the posts that went up. The the guy that's behind this has actually received death threats. There there are fans of uh, Young G's work that have honestly threatened this French developer because they feel that strongly that they are actually uh, stealing from this artist. Now, mind you, his artwork was fed into this a artificial intelligence engine without the permission of his family. So th this guy just on his own did it, put this out there, and it is just it it's not it's not exactly the the a good look and it says in japan the lenient laws on copyright and data scraping uh the rise of these models isn't just blurring lines around ownership and liability but really stoking panic that artists will lose their livelihoods i think they fear that they're training for something they won't ever be able to live off of because they're going to be replaced by artificial intelligence long story short is that you can pump into these engines millions, if not billions of images. And then on the other side comes out a creation, but the creation is based upon what it was taught. And what it was taught was artwork that has been created by other people or images that have actually been taken by people. And, and I want to maybe talk about that a little bit later. Um, but, but this is a really interesting thing. And in fact, if you go on Instagram right now, what you may actually see is that there are a lot of artists that are putting up a no AI art post on Instagram right now because they do not agree with things like this that are happening right now. And so I want to bring onto the show somebody that can maybe help me to, to make sense of this a little bit. Uh, and to that point, I want to welcome my buddy, Mark. Mark, how are you doing, brother? I'm doing good, Reggie. I, uh, as we talked, I, I am suffering a little bit of a head cold. So uh, if you know I go off camera, it's because something bad happened. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully nothing, nothing terrible will happen, my friend. Uh, but, but Mark, um, you had a chance to read this article. I think you've, yeah. you've thought about this a little bit on your own. Are we living in the wild, wild west again? Like what is going on with this artificial intelligence? Talk with me. Yeah, this, I think we're back into the wild, wild west again. I mean, it's called WWW for a reason, the World Wide web, like it is wild, wild west. So we're coming up with stuff faster and pumping it out faster because we're trying to get ahead of the other guy. You know, I want to be the first one that does it without thinking about, okay, what's the ramifications of it? Mm. What should I, or shouldn't I just because mm. I can, should I, and if we are going to do it, how are we going to do it? So yeah. um, this stuff really interests me as you and I have talked. I mean, I'm reading uh, artificial, artificial intelligent comic right now that has been put out by a company. It's the very first one. And I was intrigued. Okay, what's this all about? It's another indie. And how did they come up with it? What are they doing? Uh, are they infringing on someone's intellectual property or what is what are they doing here? Yeah. So so I had never heard of this artificial intelligence comic until you started talking with me about it a couple of weeks ago, right? But but you you I think did some research into this specific comic. What did you find? Is this comic that you're reading infringing upon someone's intellectual property? Do you want to talk about what you found? 
Sure. Cause so it's it's called Abolition of Man and it's by Living Line Publishing. They've only been out since 2020. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a four part series, which actually I just found out through diamond has been extended to a five part. So somebody's reading it, Yeah. but they're based the comic on CS Lewis's essay, which is in the public domain. You can go online and you can download it. It's free. Anybody can read it. And, uh, there's, there's no copyright. There's no, you know, like you can. And the other thing that they've done is the creators didn't use artwork. They used the word. So they used his essay and pumped it into the artificial intelligence and asked the artificial intelligence, create images related to what these words are saying, as far as the AI is interpreting it. And I can tell you, um, it's bizarre. <laughs> like it, the artwork is, if you get a chance to look at it, it's, it's out there. It's out there. Like, okay. Um, to best illustrate this, and, and I know Doug Bratton's probably watching, he always does. Um, so uh, Dave McKean, you familiar with him? Okay, he, I mean, when he started, he was doing a lot of cut and paste stuff, and a lot of people were going, that's not real art, mm -hmm. right? So he was asked by the creators, and this is a quote from him. Uh, he says, the abolition of man is a thorough test drive of AI image making, and the results are extraordinary, appalling, compelling, cold, hot, beautiful, repellent, and should be abolished. <laughs> so it's all over the place. In it's other all words. over the place. Yeah. So yeah. when I read this book and I see what it's doing, it's 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 making me kind of a little bit anxious because of the whole copyright thing. What happened to the artist, the anime art artist yeah. is just wrong. Yeah. 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 Like you can't touch someone's intellectual property till they've been gone a while. Like, and, and the sad thing was every country is different. Yeah. Every, like it's 95 years here. It's 75 there's years there. It's all over the place. It sure isn't like a week. I, I was about to say that it, it's not less than seven days that you wait. No. And this guy's like, this is, this is, this is a, a, an homage, a homage to this artist. Maybe, maybe that was his intent. Right. Maybe his intent was to pay respect. But at the same time, just because you can to your earlier point doesn't mean that you do. And as soon as the backlash started, maybe you should just pull it down because maybe it's not the right thing to actually do. And that's the struggle is to your point. I think people are in such a rush to to do that. They're not taking time to think and ask themselves if this is the right thing. Well, yeah. And like human kind has never had that problem before like should we do this like you know i've just cloned this mastodon Is, was that a mistake like anyway um it's when and i think they're being really broad with the homage brush like yeah. when i see all these different covers that are from covers from years and years ago you can see the similarity you can see you know like but they've changed the character they've changed the colors they've done some things they say this is based upon that but when you compare the actual artist's work mm. to what the AI pumped out, um, and you know, like when I first saw that, I went, "Was it AI or a photocopier?" Like, yeah, because because it looks the same. It, it is looks not the same. So it is, is not a homage to them because nothing has changed. It's no. basically his work. You know what I'm saying? It's not an interpretation of his work. It's not your rendering of his work. It's his work. That's yeah, basically that's what it, it is. Yeah. It's not a it's it's not honoring him. It's not to to my way of thinking. This is just my opinion. It's yeah, it's not taking some incredible work and putting a spin on it that is yours. And again, the artificial intelligence only does what we teach it to do. Yep. So if we've taught it to plagiarize, that's what it's gonna do. So let me ask you this. The, the article spoke about the fact, and for those that are just now joining, we are having a conversation about artificial intelligence and the the Korean artist that recently passed away, well, back in October, and less than a week after his passing, a an AI engine was basically recreating his artwork. That's essentially what we're talking about. This article hit on this notion that potentially artists will eventually be replaced by AI. Well, do you and, think that do you think that that's possible? Should they should they be in fear right now? 
I don't think they should be in fear because and we talked about this just briefly today. Um, it, I remember back uh, when that uh, Natalie Cole uh, did a music video with her deceased dad and everyone lost their minds that, oh, my God, we don't need to have new singers. We'll just bring up the dead ones and we'll put them on and manipulate them and they can sing. Um, ABBA did does a virtual reality concert. They're 70 some years old. They're not going to be doing backflips on the stage, but they do. And that goes on and on. Has it made the those industries stop? No, I don't think it has. It, it's enhanced them. And every time we get a new thing, um, you know, it's that it's new. We don't understand it. Therefore, we shall fear it. <laughs> and um, would I be nervous if I was an artist right now? I would be kind of watching, okay, if I'm not protected by copyright mm. and somebody can just take my stuff that's out there and run it through an artificial intelligence photocopier, because that is to me what that that's looked what like. Yeah. That's what it is. And then say, hey, look what I created. With Without any kind of ramifications, we are in trouble. Yes, yes. We are. So I think, again, they tried to do a national copyright, uh, not national, a worldwide copyright, and it kind of worked and it didn't. Uh, but we really need to rethink that. The, the Wild Wild West isn't going away. Um, and there needs to be some kind of protection for artists. And when you talk about that, what we were just talking about prior to me coming on, yeah, people aren't getting paid. Well, why would I bother paying an artist? You've pr provided this. I can run it through AI and tweak it, and I can pump it out. And I yeah, can change the color. I can do this. I can do that. And that would make me nervous. So and probably, I think, And probably a lot less time as well. Oh, yeah. Like you don't have deadlines. You push a button. And it's done. It comes out the other end and I can and print probably, it and I can you, sell it. Yeah. And it's probably hooked up to the, the printers, right? Exactly. And, the, and you know, like push it and have my coffee while my, you know, 150,000 <laughs> comics are pumped out. It, so I think scary. what real it's very scary. But what I think the responsibility of this is, is us, mm. the consumer. Mm. Like I wouldn't have bought that comic if I didn't have some belief that it's based upon something that's in the public domain, mm. there I wouldn't, go. I wouldn't, I, because somebody needs to be paid. It's someone's blood, sweat, and tears in that, yep. in that material, that artwork, that whether it's written, it's, it's the artwork, it's the cells, it's the inking, the lettering. We as consumers need to be a bit more responsible. And most of us are about what is, what is it we're buying? Is this a bootleg copy? Is this a, you know, is this a, a, a made up copy that someone is aging? Because we yeah. talked about that a long time yeah, ago we on did. this show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's exactly the same thing. Who's benefiting from this? Is it the person whose blood, sweat and tears are into it? Or is it somebody who's now just pocketing it because they can push a button? There we go. So I think as consumers, as, as collectors, as buyers, we need to be paying attention to this stuff and we need to be speaking up and saying, I'm not buying that because that's not, that's not a true comic. There we go. Mark, if we're going to go ahead and leave it there. I want to thank you, brother, for coming on and sharing your thoughts with me. Where can people get a hold of you on the social media? Should they choose to track you down? Well, I try to be really hard to pin down because I don't have copyright and I don't want people putting my image into, you know, <laughs> you like artificial intelligence like someone else i know yeah. and you know so yeah just on instagram and or in your chat i'm reggie collects i'm a, a true blue member of the giving gang and i'm here supporting the channel make it great just like because all of your blood sweat and tears and the time you take away from your family to keep us entertained i appreciate you, you reggie you're a good man i try brother thank you for coming on i absolutely appreciate it feel better and tell the wife uh thank you for loaning us or loaning you to us for a little bit here I will. All right. Take care. Take care. All right. So um, to, to the point that was made a hot second ago, uh, we, we've been talking about these, these databases, right? These databases that are out there that are, that are pumped full of images. What they are doing is they are taking artists artwork and they're pumping it into these images. They're scraping uh, social media, they're scraping the internet, and they're, they're teaching these artificial intelligence engines using lots of lots of images, millions, if not billions of images. And so uh, one of the creators that I spoke with earlier earlier this, uh, this week that is actually doing some research into some of this stuff actually sent me uh, an article, the article linked to a database that has been created that has a small fraction 
of one AI engine's uh, database captured in it. And so for, for giggles, for, for giggles, I decided to test this thing out and to see what kind of images would potentially be pulled up. And so because, again, the images drive what comes out the other end. So the question is, what kind of images are in this thing? So you have a, a couple of images here of Stan Lee. And I think there's, what, 664 rows, which I'm guessing is 664 images of Stan Lee alone that are probably not licensed images. I actually just showed this one just the other day. This is the ad that's a, uh, a tribute to Stan that appeared in Marvel Comics. But a bunch of images of Stan Lee going back to what appears to be maybe his youth. So I, I wanted to search for uh, Jack Kirby. Let's see if we can get Jack Kirby up in here. Jack Kirby is also in here. There's only 27 lines of, uh, of Jack Kirby. But again, this is a very small subset, but you can see some of Jack Kirby's actual artwork that is actually in this engine. I mean, him in his uniform back in the day is already in there. And I decided to get a little frisky. I decided to actually search for myself and sure enough, sure enough, much to my surprise, there was a not so good photo of, of Reggie Simmons with dumbbells. This is a photo that I took back in Orlando back in the day. Uh, my image is actually in there. And so my likeness is caught up in the AI engine without my permission and, and probably without the permission of uh, the the uh, photographer uh, that took that photo of me so many years ago. So again, it's just, it's an interesting time. And again, it is to some degree or another, the wild, wild west. And even though we can, the question is, should we, uh, but to that point, I wanted to invite another, <laughs> I wanted to invite another guest on to maybe, uh, talk with me ever so briefly about this topic as well. And so I want to welcome to the show, somebody that's been here before, Matt, it is good to see you, brother. Good to see you, Reggie. Thanks for having me back. Matt, what is on your walls right now on that back wall? Okay, so um, that's my collection of Bruno Redondo original art. Uh, most of them covers to uh, Nightwing. Um, there's a couple of splash pages as well, page ones. And then um, on this side, you've got three different um, ages, if you will, of John Kent from Super Sun's annual cover by um, Jorge Jimenez. Um all the way down to a recent action cover, which I think was when he first took over the title. So it's, you see Superman flying away and John Kent with uh, Lois Lane on the front porch. That's very cool, man. You told me I would like the background. You are, you were spot on, but I, I have to ask, and please don't take offense. Sure. Is that real artwork? Is that artificial intelligence generated artwork that you have back on that wall trying to fake it? What is this? I'll tell you what though. It is, it is um, in most cases, in some of the cases, it is um, physically rendered artwork. And in a lot of cases, Bruno Redondo works digitally. Mm, so it go. is the artist proof and the only edition of it. Um, and in some cases, a lot of guys that are working digitally We'll do a um, a blue line printout in ink. Yep. So I've got some of that work as well. So it's it's kind of a good match for the conversation because what we're looking at here is a new technology mm. that is adapting what we've already known and presenting it in a different way. And I think I don't think we're even in the wild west yet. I think we're in the stone age. I think that um, okay. When you look at the like the five U guy that did the um the kind of copy of uh kim young gi stuff yeah that it really is just a capture and interpretation the way that you might just put a filter on something i've seen a lot much more sophisticated stuff we've seen it all over our facebook pages of people you know popping in an image of themselves and getting back some really interesting things yeah or they type in their name and they or they'll say something like when i saw was um jedorowski's star wars you know, and it will take images of El Topo or Holy Mountain or Santa Sangre and mix it with, you know, images from Star Wars or from Dune and get a kind of hybrid of whatever these algorithms have programmed it would look like to be. But when it comes to creators, we still need someone to figure out what they're going to type into these machines. We still need people that are going to engineer this from where it's at now to a kind of Spotify version of this, mm -hmm. you know, like where Spotify was just trying to compete with Pirate Bay, you know, and trying to make a legal way for um, artists to continue to make money and yeah. ironically becomes the thing that upsets the music industry. And now artists complain that they don't make any money. But of course, as we all know, $18 a month is more than $0 a month. 
And so while the, the law of diminished returns may be in effect here in the music industry, and it seems like it's going to change again, that when we look at art, and as somebody who's run art galleries, I'm very conscious of the concerns of artists. I've seen many artists have their work wind up on T-shirts and Chinese websites, yeah. um, you know, working from just the smallest JPEGs. I've had artists that will even use a, a like a watermark on their work, and they'll use uh, a, a pretty sophisticated add-on to Photoshop to just take that off. So there's really no protection. Um, if someone's going to steal, they're going to steal. Um, the biggest concern is, I think, for artists, how much will that theft impact my life? Mm -hmm. Will I stop booking work because an editor at The New Yorker is going to use a computer to produce an editorial cartoon rather than have me do it? And I think that to a large degree, there's not a lot to worry about there. Okay. But where you will see some, I think, jobs disappear is going to be on the web, you know, in a web 3.0 world that, that we're getting into where we're looking at um, devices that are being operated, one man publishing companies that don't have a lot of resource that are very much editorial that want this, 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 and this exactly as they want it. They can keep, you know, rolling the dice until they get what they want. It becomes a game of patience. It becomes a game of how good is the algorithm? How good are you at manipulating the algorithm? And I think that is still an art form. You know, we can say that, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of thievery, but, you know, at the end of the day, it really has to come down to, is this a device that in the hands of truly talented people will become a very good thing? And just like we saw with a lot of NFT artwork, the first NFTs that were gaining attention weren't necessarily good artworks, but there's a lot of really incredible NFTs out there, you know, so, stuff so that can never be flat. So there were there was a lot in that. So I want to try to parse some of that out. Sure. Part part of what I heard you say there is that potentially artists need to look at artificial intelligence and what's happening now as a potential partnership opportunity. Did did yes. I hear that correct as a way? So instead of being fearful of it, embrace it and yeah. use it to your advantage. Am I hearing that correct? Absolutely. I think that very talented people and extremely gifted illustrators can speed up their process by using the machines to manipulate what they draw. Mm. If you're not looking at something else, if you're not trying to find something that's stolen, say, or even like a public domain image that's being manipulated. I mean, look at all the um, the grief that we gave Greg Land for using, you know, Xeroxes, a fashion magazines, porn films, you name it and having that wind up as X-Men. Now, what was wrong about that wasn't that the artwork wasn't good, and we can say, well, at least he was drawing it. Maybe he was lightboxing it. That's mm -hmm. tracing. So is inking. Yeah. You know, like, so it really depends on, you know, how you come at Where you want to draw that line. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, we, you know, I find it kind of interesting that a lot of comic fans and comic collectors had no care about protecting the rights of the people who created these characters. You know, when the Kirby estate tried to, you know, get into their litigation with Marvel before it came to terms, there were a lot of fans that were mad at the Kirby estate for coming forward and trying to get a piece of this enormous pie for the person and the person's family who created the entire pie. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. we're seeing a certain type of different outrage about, um, you know, how AI is, is stealing from artists. But again, it's not a straight theft. If you're running it through some kind of software I mean, in the, like I said, the five you guys program seems very unsophisticated. It really just seems like a little more than a filter. Yeah. Like he's, he's scanning in something, he's getting back something very similar, but the AI that really does transform or uses phrases to create new artwork is on a very different level. And I think it's a much more sophisticated algorithm. And I think that if you are copying a style, but producing new work, well, that's what all artists have done since time immemorial. Okay. Is that they're inspired by something. They try to copy a style. They try to work in their own way. Then they eventually find their own, you know, niche. They find their own ability and their, their technical differences. And their own voice within that. Certainly, certainly. The, the other part of what I think I heard you say was that artists don't necessarily need to worry about being replaced because that article spoke about just a straight on replacement. I think of what I heard you say is that there could be situations in which art is created, but that art probably would not have been an actual job to begin with. Right. Correct. Uh, but, but there will still be space and opportunities for true artists to be able to create art the same way that they are doing now. So in other words, 
the the uh, Skynet is not completely taking over humanity. Is that is that a fair statement to make? I think that's a fair statement. I, I don't think that we have to worry about a lot of artists losing their jobs to a very simple AI program. And it will get more complicated. And, and then the conversation will become more complicated mm. as it did with Spotify. And I think Spotify is a great example of how we might look at this. That when they came in, you know, all of the music players were pretty unsophisticated. You know, you bought a whole album, you listened to it. Um, the stream time was really terrible. You had to download it and then import it and then listen. And they got that speed down to nothing, you know, less than two um, tenths of a second, which uh, people perceive as instantaneous. And so once you look at how that algorithm transformed music, it actually saved the music industry. Mm. Um, you know, that if everybody's pirating and all these companies were laying off people, 20 people a week, um, what ended up happening is that it stopped people getting fired at the music business. And they, they started going out and looking for more acts to sign because mm. they had this new way of making money. Hmm. And I think that artists have to come to realize that any technology is a tool that is used best in the hands of people that know how to use tools. You know, so if you're, you're good at illustration and you take this new technology and you have it enhance your illustration, then you're going to be much more productive. You'll probably be happier. Or, you know, if you're like me and you find new technology, you may dive into the rabbit hole and your family doesn't see you for a month. But, you know, at the end of it, I think you'll get, you know, good art out of that. But in the meantime, we're going through, I think, these training wheel stage of, of AI where it's not particularly good. I respect all of the artists that I know and represent who are very unhappy with all this AI stuff being presented. And I think they're kind of smart to at least sound the whistle and say, hey, wait a minute, maybe this isn't such a good thing so that we think about it and so that we have conversations about it. There you go. I think that's the other really important part about it is that if they just remain silent, then then maybe it would go a different way. But by voicing some concerns to, to a Mark's point, it gets us as consumers to talk about it and to pay attention and to ask some questions and maybe to help guide this thing in a way where it's actually constructive and not a destructive influence on what we all love. Um, Matt, I want to thank you for coming on, man. Sure. I, I did not know what you were going to say. Um, the perspective I think is fresh. It's different than maybe what we've heard out there. And that's, again, we have to have a discussion. We have to put these things out there for people to think about. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, but to that point, where can people get a hold of you? Should they want to find you on the social media? They can look for me at, at pop sequentialism um, on the Instagram and Twitter. You can go to the pop sequentialism website, you know, www.popsequentialism.com. Um, I will try and spell it out by memory and I'm probably going to spell it wrong. But uh, P O P S E Q U E N T I A L I S M. You're a brave man. I would have, <laughs> I would have absolutely butchered that spelling. Uh, but thank you, uh, thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing your perspective, and thank you for demonstrating uh, what what a good spelling champion you actually are. Uh, it's good to see you, brother. Take good care. Good to see you too. Cheers. All right. Again, I, I love honestly doing these live streams, having these guests on because I, I honestly don't know what's going to come out of their mouths. And and, and I think that uh, what we heard over the course of tonight is several different points of view, several different perspectives. And all of this is being done to give you as the, the viewer some things to think about, some things to consider so that you can land on what your truth actually is. And it's about raising the flag like my my reel earlier this week where I talked about the Lanza terms of service contract, which I thought was incredibly uh, intrusive and very broad, but I could say the same thing about TikTok. And again, these are two reels that are up on Instagram right now. It's about starting a conversation so that we can make more informed decisions that actually work for us. So I want to thank everybody that, that came out to join the live stream. If you all enjoyed this show, I want to encourage you to go ahead and hit the thumbs up button. Uh, if you want to share this with people out there that might benefit from, you know, hearing the conversation that just occurred over the course of the last hour, I definitely want to encourage you to share it. If you have not yet picked up a copy of either Isolation Issue Number 2 or the Guide to Smart Comic Collecting, I want to encourage you to go ahead and snag a copy on ReggieCollects.com. I have been patiently waiting for the printer to get back to me to let me know uh, what is going on with the shipment. I am still patiently waiting. But the good thing is if you decide to get a copy of the guide, I have the Wizard homage cover available for immediate shipping. 
Um, if you have questions, if you have thoughts, don't hesitate to reach out to me on Instagram. Uh, and again, shout out to everybody that was in here hanging out, being part of the conversation. Take care and have a good night. My body ate itself until it found this passion. They got fat while we starved, but it's power and fasting. Until I turn to ashes, I remain stoic through my rap heroics. I painted 10,000 poems, then I drank the potion of poetry in motion. I started choking, it was potent. My throat chakra downloaded, knowledge hungry. I was embarrassed I could ask my parents for money when I had a full tummy. So I asked for wisdom, better than crypto, sweeter than honey. I don't take it for granted, I don't wear capes and masks.